how lovely to see you all here um, this evening with such a beautiful smattering of men and women, I can see, which is very <laughs> nice for a subject like this, which is, of course, the family and uh, the modern family. Um, and the family being, of course, the foundation stone of our society. It's what everything sort of emanates from. And as our society is changing, families are changing and the two are inextricably linked. And that's what we're here to talk about tonight is, is the concept of the modern family. Now, you might be surprised to learn that in Australia, 43% of children are now growing up in families which are deemed sort of non-traditional. So that's mum, dad, two kids. Two out of every five kids in Australia are either in a step family, a blended family, um, a same-sex family, a single parent family. So the concept of what a, a family is, is changing so rapidly, yet we perhaps haven't caught up with that as a society. Um, and this evening we're going to be talking about that with people who have very different experiences of, of what it is to be a modern parent and, or a modern child in, in the modern family. Um, I'll introduce them in a moment. First of all, I'm Madeline Morris. I host the Question Time series here at the Wheeler Centre. We do one of these once every month. So if you like asking questions of people who know a lot about really interesting things, then please come along to some of our other ones. Um, I'm in my day job, I'm a reporter for, for 7.30. I'm currently on maternity leave at the moment. I've got a five-year-old and a three-month-old, so this is the first time I haven't had vomit on me all day, which is a very nice <laughs> feeling. Uh, but I'm, I'm living in sort of a traditional family, so it's my, my husband and I and, and two kids, although my um, eldest daughter almost ended up an only child, which is becoming increasingly common in our modern lives. Um, so tonight we're going to talk about with our three panellists uh, all of many, many things talking about the, the idea of modern family. So the pros and cons of different families, um, what more we could do to support different families and I'm sure that some of the panellists tonight will talk about some of the, challenge, the challenges that there are in supporting different types of families. Uh, we also want to talk about whether with these changes, the notion of the old family is going to become obsolete and if there's anything wrong with that or if we'll be losing something by if we don't have the nuclear family anymore. So um, let me introduce you to our panellists um, who really are have written two fantastic books and one whose book I hope is on the way. Um, so I'll start first with Chloe here, Chloe Shorten. Uh, Chloe is a public affairs specialist and she's the author of Take Heart, a story from modern step families. This is it here. It's going to be on sale at the back this evening. It's a fantastic book. Um, and if her last name sounds familiar to you, it's because uh, <laughs> she is, of course, married to Bill Shorten, the leader of the federal opposition. Caroline Baum uh, is a journalist and a presenter. She was the founding editor of Good Reading magazine. And she's the author of just published only a singular memoir, which is absolutely unput downable and again on sale down the back tonight and I recommend anyone to, to pick it up if you like a good read um, quality literary memoir absolutely is what it is um, and Alina Muhammad Ali is a queer Muslim activist um, she's formerly a lawyer and she's now deep in the trenches as a primary school teacher doing the best for not only your own family, but all sorts of other families as well. So I think what we might do is um, we'll, we'll do some introductions here. Now, this, have, this is question time, so that means that the floor is open to you. It's not a panel discussion. These are, this is your opportunity to ask as many questions as, you've, as you want of these three very accomplished and very diverse speakers here this evening. So please don't be shy. What always happens is we always get a million questions at the end. So my tip is to get your question in early if you know that there is one that you want to ask. And the ushers will come down and they'll be scanning. So try and grab the eye of the ushers if you can because I can't really see people particularly well from here. So um, put your hand up and, and they'll come to you and then we'll do that in order. So we'll do that for the next 15 minutes or so. But um, Chloe, why don't you start off talking about your family? I think we'll, uh, we'll all describe our particular families to begin with. <laughs> My family of origin or my family... You're, you're the of, family that inspired you to write the book, I think. Oh, the family that inspired... OK, so I have three children, um, one of whom is in grade two and then a 14 and 15-year-old, so they've got a seven, eight-year age gap, um, boy, girl, girl. And uh, we moved... I moved to Melbourne from Queensland about eight years ago to have my baby and to get married a second time and uh, to Bill. 
and it's uh, it's been a journey. <laughs> so I thought that to write this book for me was about the book that I wanted to read and wasn't really there. I mean, there were some wonderful memoirs out there and there's great research, but it, what I didn't find was, because I'm a sort of booky, my kids would call me nerdy type, um, I wanted to find the research and I wanted to try and integrate that research in with my own experience to help me uh, navigate that that sort of path really. What I loved about your book is that uh, in reading it, it's not just for step families, mm. it's, it's actually all blended families, it's actually mm. for all families there's all mm. sorts of fantastic advice in there and what I really took away from it was that um, being in a step family, you've actually worked a lot harder mm. at being a family and creating those bonds than people in your sort of average, which we now know is not average anymore, um, nuclear mm. family do. I think that um, what, what I learned was that uh, often we, we parent and we um, partner by, by sort of by instinct and so much of what I uncovered over the last sort of five years of reading and reading about it was that there's a lot that we can do that's very protective for our family, whatever family form that is. And, um, you know, my dad, who's an architect, always said to me, form follows function. <laughs> and, you know, it's that great uh, Roman um, architect uh, um, from a thousand years ago who said this. And, and uh, it's so true that that's primarily what I found in this book, is that the functioning of the family is much more crucial than the form of the family and that if you are um, looking after how your family functions, getting the best possible advice, the best possible support and environment around you, no matter what your family form is, the outcomes are invariably better and that, that all the evidence points to that. So. And there's some great research that yeah. you quote in there, which I'm sure you'll Lots. get into yeah, <laughs> later on tonight as well. So, um, Caroline, you... I mean, your book is absolutely stunning and it is... <clears throat> When you say a, a singular memoir, it's, there's a lot of meanings to the word singular there because, of course, you are an only child, but also you've really had quite an extraordinary upbringing, I think, very non-average. So tell us about your own upbringing. Um, well, uh, I suppose the book comes out of realising that being an only child is singular, that, that it means that... Um, you don't have anyone to compare yourself to when you're growing up and you are the focus of attention and sometimes that attention is very desirable and sometimes it's <laughs> very stifling and you, you can find yourself so, sort of um, feeling like you're growing up in a hot house. And so because my parents, I think the other thing that really is important about um, the story that I'm telling is that I'm the only child of two parents who had extremely traumatic childhoods. And so I'm, I'm growing up trying to work out why my parents react the way they do, behave the way they do, why everything in our house is so intense so that it's only when I go to other people's homes, for example, that I realise that the air in other people's houses doesn't seem as heavy. It's as if the molecular structure of the air in my house is made of a different sort of set of... Um, atoms and chemicals and and really that's because my parents didn't talk very openly or readily about the tragedies that had befallen them so in the case of my mother she was orphaned at the age of five as a result of a murder suicide and in the case of my father he was wrenched away from his parents at the age of 10 and fostered into England as a little Jewish boy from Vienna as part of something called Kinder Transport, which was the largest refugee rescue operation of the 20th century and took 10,000 children away from the Nazis and brought them to safety. So when you grow up in that kind of atmosphere, there is an incredible burden on you of expectations. And although I had a very privileged childhood, I wanted to explore what some of the expectations were and what the transactions are, because there is a deal um, when you're an only child and your parents want everything for you that they couldn't have for themselves, there, there is a deal there and it, and it can be quite an onerous one to sort of um, fulfil. Mm. Um, and only children are becoming more and more common in our society. Um, they often get a really bad rap, don't they, only kids? We have an image problem. We need a makeover <laughs> badly. We really, really do. I mean, I think it's really extraordinary that when you're an only child, people feel that it's kind of 
open slather to say to you when they meet you, oh, I bet you were spoiled. You know, you don't go around saying to middle or, or you know, um, last children, I bet you're an underachiever. <laughs> but, but when you meet an only child, you can say absolutely anything you like to them. Um, and the first psychologist to ever write about only children in, I think, 1898 referred to us as deviants and told parents that if they were thinking of having only one child, they'd be better off having none. Because we were going to be, that word again, a burden on society. Well, clearly you are. I mean, <laughs> obviously that's come to fruition, so that psychologist really knew what they were talking about. But it's something that we're going to have to think a lot more about, isn't it? As we do, I mean, as I, my own daughter almost ended up being an only child, didn't quite, but... People often give the example of China and, you know, the little prince, little princesses. And I wonder about how much those monikers are really deserved. Well, I think that, you know, from my point of view in terms of writing the memoir, that the arc of the story takes me to the other end of the experience of being an only child, which I felt had not been written about much. So there are quite a lot of memoirs about the solitude of, of childhood for an only child. But it's the responsibility of the adult only child that I also have had to experience yeah. because my parents um, were 12,000 miles away in England uh, when one of them became sick and the other one uh, had a, a total mental breakdown. Um, I had to drop everything here and go because there wasn't anybody else. And I think that that's the part of the only child experience as an adult. What's fascinating is statistically 80% um, of only children do not put their parents in care. We take that responsibility upon ourselves because we have known all along that that is our duty and our destiny. And I really wanted to explore that and talk about what that feels like. It feels incredibly lonely and terrifying. Um, but my, my story is not unique. I, I know that now from readers that other people have said to me, yes, this was my experience. And I'm, I'm glad that you've talked a little bit about it because, as you say, as more and more of us have only children, as we have our children later, this is going to be the payoff and we need to think about it. Mm. And uh, Alina, you're probably the, in the least common family so far, <laughs> um, but will certainly become more common in the future. Tell us about your family. Well, two years ago, I would be happily saying that I'm in a same-sex relationship, uh, a 10-year committed relationship, as boring as anything, with two kids and two cats. And now, two years since then, I've, uh, I'm divorced or deregistered or whatever language to use. And I actually find that I'm now in that world of sole parent. So I'm a single mother now with two boys. And my ex is the same as well. So after years and years of um, fighting and continuing to believe in, recognise same-sex relationships, I'm now sitting in this really awkward world in which I've been in a committed relationship that failed and I'm trying to find where my space is or where I belong. Mm -hmm. And if you go to um, the queer bookstore in Fitzroy, there are no books for mm -hmm. my children. There aren't. There are plenty of books. Oh, I have two mums, I have two dads, because that's become something that people know about, two mums, two dads. But where are the books are, I have two mums and they don't live together. Mm. I have two mums and I have two separate houses, two separate worlds. And there isn't that there. Is that going to be your book? <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> so how do you find people speak to you about that? Are people able to ask you questions? How does, how does school, how do your, your boys school, how do they deal with that? You know, are we set up to actually cope with that kind of a family? The interesting thing is that most people don't seem to understand that we are not together, even though we are rarely in the same space together. We do change over through school. And yet when I take the boys to swimming one Saturday and she takes the swim to swimming the next Saturday, the, the, the Saturday after that when I go, I'll have a mum say to me, oh, I saw your partner last weekend. And I'd be like, no, 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 no. She's not my partner. And then I think, well, why, why should I bother? In, in her mind, she's probably feeling, I accept your relationship. Mm. But there isn't one. And it, it means that I sit in this really weird world of, well, I'm actually not in a relationship with her, but we do have children together and we are committed to these boys. So it's a very odd space. Mm, very, and must feel quite lonely sometimes as well. Mm. Sad face. <laughs> yes, please. Hi. I just wanted to make two comments. Um, the first one was in relation to... Um, 
Carolyn, the, in, in France, the phrase for an only child is enfant tunique. Yes. Um, which I have an only child and I think that's a great way of thinking about it. Only, only seems sort of diminishing, whereas unique doesn't. Yeah. Um, and the sec- I'm also a separated parent and co-parent with my son's father. And I would say that um, we are still in a relationship. It's just different to the one we had when we lived in one house together. Mm. Thank you for making that point. My mother is actually French, and, and so I'm aware of being an enfant unique or a fille unique, which is more commonly um, used in France. And I agree with you. I think it's a much uh, less pejorative term. And there's something about the resonance between the word only and lonely that always makes people feel a bit sorry for you when you say you're an only child, which I don't think you would say if you were a unique child. No, but you, but you were a lonely child. I mean, tell, tell people a well, little bit about some of the experiences that you relate in the book about your, your mother becoming jealous of your friends in some way. Yes, she was. But, I mean, that was, again, you know, because of her own trauma. She had never been sort of socialised to have a steady um, family home and where, where friendships were sort of introduced into a secure sort of um, circle. I think that the thing about only children and, and loneliness is, you know, for the for the negative side point of view, yes, the holidays are long, you are often bored, you you are not necess- I, in my case, I was always hopeless at team sports at school um, because I didn't have anybody to practice with. I'm hopeless at games. I can't even shuffle cards. You know, there are all sorts of things about being an only child that I'm not very good at. But I would have to say that the flip side to that um, is that only children learn very quickly how to enjoy their own company and become quite self-sufficient. And I think that that is a life skill that you really need, no matter what your circumstances. I'm deeply suspicious if someone can't spend time on their own. It's also very much the case that only children statistically are shown to read much earlier, to have very early comprehension skills. And I don't think it's an accident that there are many, many children, uh, only children in the media, many only children who are writers. Uh, If you look at the canon of only child memoirs, you know, you've got Robert Desai, Clive James, Robin Dalton. There are all sorts of only child memoirs out there. And I think that writing is a great occupation that the only child feels an affinity for. And I don't think it's an accident that I made a career out of reading because that was where where I found my first friends. So I'm not campaigning for the rights of the only child through writing the memoir, but I do think that there are an awful lot of pluses to being an only child, um, and those those are worth mentioning as well. Mm. Can I just ask um, Chloe a question? Because I, I am also a stepmother, um, and I really wish that I had had Chloe's book as a sort of handbook and primer when I was struggling with the role of being a stepmother. And you give various sort of um, um, case histories and sort of um, models of different kinds of step families. Mm. But I was wondering about the one which was my case, my example, which was I didn't want children. I fell in love with a man who had a child. So the child was just part of the package deal. Mm. Um, and so that's, that presents a particular sort of set of difficulties to navigate mm. for a step-parent because you've got to learn the parenting skills and you've also got to learn mm. to be with a child in mm. your life, which you never imagined. Mm. So can you talk a little bit about that, about... Well, when you talk about step families, people still, I think, find, I found have this view that the step family looks like whatever the, you know, from the 1980s it was the Brady Bunch or, you know, whatever the typical things were. And I went back through, um, I did a literature review of what step families look like across, um, oh, really across sort of 400 years. And um, it is, it is actually very diverse because you can come to it in so many different ways. You can be a blended family, as people call it. Language is so interesting, isn't it? You know, you were talking about only and lonely and, mm. um, and labels. and um, it, It's actually very powerful for children, very powerful for children, much more than we, I think, ascribe to. But um, with, with step families, you can marry into, you know, so I'm not a step parent. And somebody said to me recently, so what is it about you who is not a step parent? 
you know, was, where's your expertise to write this book? And I go, well, well, I'm actually a part of a step family and I'm married to a step parent, mm. you know, but not a step parent myself. Being a part of all of those things um, means that the roles that you would normally fall into, you know, we talk about falling in love and falling pregnant and um, <laughs> lots of falling, not a lot of landing <laughs> and, um, and not a lot of um, explanation of how to land. And so uh, this really looked at, you know, I was talking to a lot of people over the last year um, just sort of when I'm standing up the back of halls in campaign time and didn't really know what to do with myself, I'd go up the back and talk to the mummies and the grandmas, which, you you know, generally mothers tend to do, get drawn to those conversations. And they were very often about, um, well, I found myself un in these circumstances, but I've made this choice. The difference is when, when you go into those relationships, not to go uh, into them thinking that you're a subcategory of a nuclear family. Mm. Step families yes. are not a subcategory of a nuclear family and therefore those roles that are the traditional role won't play out well. So it's it's understanding that you've got to negotiate those as you go in rather than going in being in a particular type of role and saying, well, I'm going to be because I'm the woman you know, or the, or the, um, you know, that I will, uh, this would, would be the nurturing role, the organising role, whatever those traditional things are. They often burden stepmothers in particular um, with a great deal of responsibility and, and very early on put a lot of pressure on the relationship too. And, and mothers, stepmothers, mm. often it seems to be that they, they put some of that pressure on themselves. Mm. Yeah. Well, but the culture too. Our yes. culture puts that, that. Yeah, absolutely. Gives them the sense that that's what they should do. You just brought up there um, talking about step families not being a lesser version of the nuclear family. Mm. They're a different type of family. And that's mm. really borne out in some of the literature that, sh that you talk about, isn't mm. it? I mean, and, and actually how much better children can be off mm. in a step family environment than in a traditional um, nuclear family environment if it's if it's not doing well. Because well. If, if that's right, if you yeah. if you're in a family that's a dysfunctional nuclear family, that's not going to give you know any benefits to the child. Mm. And I was trying to look at this from a child's point of view as much as I could. There's this fabulous fellow who had spent some time in Australia 20 years ago as a, at the Institute of Family Studies, who's now the sort of one of the leading lights of, of um, step family research really in the Western world. And, you know, he often talked about looking at it from a child's point of view and how different it is when you stop really thinking about yourselves and how you're coping as a step family, step parents, and start thinking about the child. And um, really empathising with that tends to help you take on a different role. In other words, you know, be, being a friend and um, a friend first and then the relationship follows. And uh, another, another woman, an American, you know, talks about... Uh, Co connection before correction. You know, the importance of making a connection with that child before you step into a traditional role of being a co-disciplinarian. Um, so it's really about navigating those things because um, our, our culture now does prescribe a lot of these roles based on a deficit model. You know, these children or these families still do have a sense, I think, that they are failed in some way or, um, you know... Um, not as um, not as necessarily seen as healthy as mm. the nuclear family, and in fact, the research suggests that eighty percent, up to about eighty percent, of these children are absolutely thriving. And so, the, the body of research we've done has been into the twenty percent, and and that's really crucial too. You know, it's important that we know that, mm. but to apply that twenty percent rule to the rest of the eighty percent is is not really helpful, considering we've had step families for. Hundreds forever, of years. Well, forever. Right. Well, I'll go to the mm. next question in a, in a moment, but I just want to talk to you, Alina, about that idea of roles in terms of a, a family, because for same-sex families, it can be a bit tricky, can't it? I mean, you kind of oh, look, you've got to win. in terms of societal expectations of what what the role. You know, I've heard people say, I have actually heard people say, so who's the mum and who who's uh, the dad? Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. and I'd get that too. And I'm naturally boyish, so. The assumption would be, uh, well, then you must be the dad. And it was extremely frustrating because I, um, I didn't give birth as well and we are so caught up in this idea of motherhood being tied to actually giving birth that for, for a very long time I questioned my own role, even though my son, because my ex um, it was an emergency Caesar, 
I'm the one who sat with my son mm. for a couple of hours till she came out. I'm the one who he smiled at first. I'm the one who he saw when he opened those eyes after he'd been taken off her after the touch. And so, but yet I felt, oh no, I didn't give birth, therefore I cannot be a real mother. And it took me getting to know Elliot, which would probably mean a few weeks, a few months, and me recognising what I could do and what kind of response I got for him, for me to actually go, well, guess what? I am a mother. And, and what does, in terms of the names that children, that same-sex families give each other and that children gives to that, how, what sort of an effect does that have on it? How, and how do you decide that? See, for me, I'm Pakistani, so mum's a mama, and therefore I was always going to be a mama. And my ex is English, so she was always going to be mummy. Okay, so that was so easy. It was so you... very simple. That yeah. was, what was interesting, though, was, um, yeah, if we talk how our boys were created, was um, ethnicity, um, surname, religion, all of which I got, I got, and I got. Right. So, <laughs> yes. Yeah. So the boys are brown like me. The boys have my surname. And the boys are being raised Muslim by me, even right. though my, my ex does not have any faith. Yeah. And yet she agreed because she knew and knows my family and how we are. She says, yeah, OK, the boys should be raised. It's interesting the choices that, that um, mothers make. So I've uh, just... I'm walking a similar path. My daughter is going to a Catholic school. I'm not Catholic. I'm not even religious. Um, she has his surname, not my surname. And what was the other one that you said? Uh, skin colour. Oh, yeah. She is ginger. <laughs> she is ginger and freckly. So she is full. But I still sort of, as the birth mother, I kind of... And that, that was the thing too. The, I felt ex. like I already... I got a really good deal as a part of that, you know. So I felt like I could give him... Those other things. And I know that's what my ex thought at the, and at the time. And, look, she hasn't tried to change her surname. So I'm pretty sure that that was, that was her way of making it as much as possible. And, look, before we even decided that I wasn't going to carry, um, I have a chronic mental condition. And so I went and saw obstetricians and gynaecologists. And I was told that, all right, you get pregnant, you'll end up in hospital for at least eight of those nine months. And so I was told that the risk to my health was so great that w was it a wise choice for me to carry or for her who had no medical complications? So the decision was kind of made for me mm. that, that way. Mm. But there are many um, two-mum families in which both carry. And sometimes at the same time, and I don't get that, I have to say. <laughs> Having raised two boys, my goodness. I, I, you don't want to do that, be doing that at the same time. All right, yes, please, next question. Hi. Um, thank you very much for raising the issue of uh, only children. Uh, being a uh, child of an ex-serviceman who uh, husband and wife separated within six months of birth, then to be raised by uh, grandparents and aunties while the mother had to go off to work because there was no support in those days. Um, I've never worn a dress. I don't wear makeup, so somehow or other the male characteristics came through. It was interesting that you raised the comment about how we being alone do certain things and achieve and uh, I'm very happy in my own skin when I'm uh, alone. Uh, I've achieved a fair bit by myself without having brothers or sisters and heaps of cousins, uh, which were good because you better beat them up and then cry poor because I was the only child. Um, so it was just fascinating and thank you very much for raising that because it settled something back in my mind. So, so just you. while you've got the microphone, um, can I just ask you... Sorry, Carol, I'll let, I'll, I'll let you respond to that and then I'll ask a question back to the gentleman. Well, no, I'm, I'm delighted. And I think, you know, that one of the things that only children do as well as, you know, you clearly learn to enjoy your own company and that's, that, I think, is a, is a very, very important skill to have in life. But the other thing is that, you know, when you go out into the world and you make friends, first of all, you take friendship very seriously. You really do. Maybe some people think you take it too seriously. But also sometimes you can create your own family. You can adopt other families. I did that. You know, when I found the lack in my own family because I didn't have grandparents and I didn't have aunts and uncles and I didn't have brothers and sisters, I went and borrowed other people's. I, I adopted other families and created them. So I think that families are very fluid things that you can create and mould in all sorts of different shapes. You don't have to deal with just what fate has handed you. And so just while you've got the microphone, uh, you know, as you're getting 
older, I mean, one of the things that we talked about when we wanted to have a second child was that um, we didn't want our eldest daughter to be alone. And I wonder if, if that ever, if you've ever thought about that, if you'd like someone um, now who is a sibling to hang around to, to talk well, to. Yeah, well, the interesting part of it all really was my partner of almost 50 years. Um, we had two children and I was typical of the male at the time. Went off to work and you did everything because you worked for your child, worked for your family. But in my mid-40s, I wanted to have another child. And I couldn't convince her to have another child. So I passed up, but I reckon I would have made a, a great, a better father that second time around <laughs> because I'd been through that trying to produce everything for the family. Mm. And uh, sad, but that's the way it goes. Well, what about you, Caroline? As you're sort of getting older now, do you feel the lack of siblings in a different way? Does it, does it even enter your head? Well, certainly, um, you know, when, when my father got sick very suddenly with dementia and, and my mother just sort of turned into, you know, that bit in The Wizard of Oz where the Wicked Witch of the West, I think, becomes a puddle? My mother became that puddle instantly on, on my fa father's diagnosis. I have never felt more alone in my life. I mean, I have an incredibly supportive husband, but he was here and I was there. Um, and... I had no idea what a burden of responsibility it was to suddenly have to decide where to put my father to get the best care and how to make sure at a certain point that my mother didn't commit suicide, which is what she was threatening to do. I know that in families with siblings, one of the things that happens is what I sort of call the King Lear syndrome, where you know, siblings don't necessarily agree about what is best when it comes to looking after older parents. They do the sort of Gonrill and Reagan thing of going, I've had him, it's your turn. You know, there's an awful lot of argy-bargy and arguing that goes on. I'm not romanticising or idealising what happens in normal families, well, in traditional families with siblings, not normal families. There are no normal families. Um, but I do know that this is a source of great conflict and tension in families. Um, uh, and so I think, you, you know, you always want what you can't have, but I do see that for siblings it can be very difficult and that often the decision to put a, a, an elderly parent into care is sometimes the only neutral space that siblings can agree on because they don't feel comfortable taking that burden or that responsibility or that role on for themselves. Mm. Um, and just while we're talking about siblings, I, I wonder, Chloe, about with your own children, if you feel comfortable talking about this, for your elder two children, how having that third child, which belonged, which was your new child that you had with your new husband, whether that played a role in sort of cementing the, the new family? Oh, absolutely. I'm interested to hear Caroline talking about that sense of, you know, the only child being able to uh, entertain themselves. The, the gap between the, the older two, their gap was only 16 months, so I had two babies in two years. Mm. And they have been, you know, lots of friends of ours call them Irish twins, and they have been very, very close, very competitive with one another, but they have been their, each other's mainstay. And then, you know, seven years later, along comes this, this new person. And she is actually much more self-sufficient at play. Those two are always with each other. And she will create the most complicated scenarios of, you know, that, but she loves that um, uh, independence and she knows how to do that because when they were away at school and she was at home on her own, mm -hmm. you know, she was uh, having the experience in some respects of yes. being an only child. But on the other hand, she's got these two now teenage siblings who are teaching her things that I'm very unhappy about that. <laughs> and, um, and so, you know, we, we constantly go between them also. At the moment, they are her great protectors, so if ever she's in trouble with us, they will come and whisk her away like the Punch and Llama and, you know, on the velvet pillow with the bells <laughs> and act as though she's this, you know, precious little thing. Don't you dare say that to our sister. Uh, and we're like... She's just in trouble because she, you know, did something and she spilled all, you know, all the dishwashing mm. liquid all over them. You know. <laughs> um, so, so the roles are really interesting. Yeah, you know, they, very different. They go from being 
Um, and we're very conscious not to make them mini parents because they're not that, mm. they, they don't have mm. as a, much as, as they big probably gap, think you know. that they could be. Whereas I grew up with lots and lots of really big Catholic families around me in, um, in Brisbane. Just for some reason, there was just a huge number of very big Catholic families in St Lucia. I don't know what was in the water. It was an <laughs> academic, you know, an ap academic suburb in middle middle class, middle Brisbane. And um, but this whole group, and there were some of them who had gaps between them of twenty years. You know, so these huge families, and then all their cousins. And we were the only Anglicans, so we were the only, um, and were constantly being rung up. By, you know, my parents constantly being rung up by. Um, of one Monsignor or another saying, oh, it's a, we've got Chloe here at Mass. Is that all right, Quentin? <laughs> yes, that's fine. You know, she's like, because you end up just going along with these huge numbers. Of, um, but, but they raised each other, you know, these, these mm. older siblings and these littler ones. And it was so alluring to me, even though I was one of five, um, that amazing Which is no big... slouch in the child no, department, I, mean, I have that's to say. Right. But we yeah. were, there were five under seven, so we were one, two, three, you know, and so... It's funny that you yeah. mentioned that because <laughs> you're really giving me a sense of that clan and that tribe, yeah. which I absolutely, you know, I wanted that. Yeah, but I wanted to be an only child. Well, you always want what you can't have. But you see, when I, when I experienced that, I, I would go off to other families which were noisy and I loved all the sort of rough and tumble and the sort mm. of chaos of mealtimes which were very formal uh, at, at my place. But I have to say that again as an only child, after a certain amount of all of that chaos, mm. I'd think, Retreat. oh, I just want to go <laughs> home. And the first time I went for a sleepover, it was very, very difficult for me to negotiate a sleepover because my parents were so fearful of the world because of what had happened to them that their mantra really was, trust no one. And they would not allow me out because they really thought that the world was a very dangerous place. That was the evidence that they had. So finally, at the age of 11, I negotiate a sleepover. I go and... Um, after dinner, the, the girlfriend that I go and stay with, my best friend Antonia, pops into the bath with her elder sister Karen and invites me to get in the bath with them. And I look at this dirty, soapy water in complete <laughs> horror. And I ask the parents in the house, uh, may I use the telephone? And I go to the telephone and in front of the parents, I call my mother and I say, come and get me, they're dirty. <laughs> Yeah, I was just... <laughs> oh, you would have loved our house. <laughs> <laughs> and how did things go with Antonia after that? <laughs> well, things after that get more complicated with Antonia. There's a whole other, <laughs> okay. a whole other story <laughs> with Antonia. But, but, you know, I mean, it, it was very much a kind of a push-pull that there was this fascination with, with tribes but also a kind of wanting to be able to withdraw and shut the door. And, you know, it was only when I went to other people's houses that I realised it was abnormal that I had a playroom and a bedroom and a bathroom of my own. And I'd never had to share the bathwater with anybody. Thank mm. you very much. Mm. <laughs> OK, next question, please. I'd just be interested in the panel's thoughts about children born through um, artificial reproductive technology and acknowledging the... The, um, the speaker who's already attended to that, but many children now are born uh, through surrogacy. We have a diminution in local adoptions and an increase in inter-country adoptions as small as it is across Australia. But we have also got a significant amount of um, women approaching uh, clinics who wish or need for... Um, IVF help from uh, egg donors in across the world and I think just be interested in us considering that there are many different forms of family conception which may ultimately also have a meaning for family formation. Mm. And, and also how complicated that is as well. Um, just from my own perspective, I've done quite a lot of reporting on surrogacy and, and really... The, the laws as it stands really are, are not equipped to deal with the complexities of surrogacy at, at the moment. Did anyone have any thoughts about that? I don't one? have it on surrogacy, but um, on IVF, um, our babies are IVF babies. And interestingly enough, we had to go to Canberra at the time because Victoria hadn't caught up to the ACT and we weren't actually able to access because she wasn't medically 
infertile. She was socially infertile, i.e. lesbian. Mm. And that's what the court cases had claimed. Now, the irony is I could have accessed um, sperm because I am medically infertile, mm. but she couldn't. So we went to the ACT, which didn't have that restriction. And the requirement there was that you went through counselling, you had to wait 12 months, you know, there, there was a proper procedure in place. And then, yes, you were able to select donors, and as we did, and then, out, you know, the IVF thing has happens. I injected her a bit too many times. She went a little bit crazy. Sorry about that. <laughs> that was not deliberate, trust me. <laughs> it was really not deliberate. And, um, yeah, the, um, they call them um, blastocysts, the embryos, once they're... Um, in goes the sperm and let's try and make a um, make something out of that and then they put it back in and if you're lucky you get a baby. It mm. sounds very simple but, but we didn't go... Th surrogacy was something wasn't even a thing because obviously her eggs, she had plenty of eggs so mm. it wasn't something we went down and for us it was just how do we create a family. Now I did want to look into adoption, I did. I really wanted to look into fostering, I wanted to look into adoption but here it goes back to this whole concept of being a mother and she really wanted to carry. She wanted to have that experience of carrying. So I, I couldn't say... And the say technology it. lets us do that mm. is the That's other thing. Not, not always. It doesn't always work out, but, off, but often it does. Chloe, did you look at this in some of your research? I'm trying to, to think about whether you no, sort of I talk about but, the but social I, effect of that. No, I didn't. I, I, I must say, I mean, I came across some of the, the data, but most of what, mostly what I was looking for was not how they got there, but what, what we're doing with the children when we get them. Mm. And how are we focusing on what they what is best for them as a community and as a neighbourhood and a society and country. And I'm quite interested. There are two Oxford scholars who've done essentially what's known as the Oxford um, book of the history of the family. And it sort of goes with thousands of years of um, uh, uh, data regression analysis, serious number crunching that they've done. And largely it tells us that communities and societies will absorb and normalise and work out the best possible way to support different types of families and different forms of families and that um, I'm very optimistic about our ability to um, understand the conundrum, whatever it might be, whatever the ethical questions are, whatever the, um, the social issue is of the day, that we, that we do work ourselves through it and that in history, you know, there's always been diversity in families of all different kinds. I'd like to think that um, how we go about managing, looking after, parenting, caring for people who go down that path of surrogacy is the more important part and, um, and that we can actually do that. Um, but, you know, the evidence shows us that we can do that as a society, that, you know, things normalise over time. And, and that doesn't mean that, you, you know, that it's easy. It just means that if we actually understand what, we're, what, what the landscape looks like, part of the problem that we have in Australia and, and in a lot of countries, actually, Western countries, wherever they take a census, is that um, the census is not necessarily asking the right questions. So we don't really know as much as we need to know about what families look like. And particularly in Australia, we've got a lot of under-reporting and under-acknowledgement uh, of family types. Um, in Indigenous communities, for example, we are calling some of these families a particular kind of family. Those children and a lot of those communities are the ones who determine who is their kin. You know, so we're talking about mm. kin as opposed to uh, uh, your family you know, blood relations. Um, and when you talk to these children, I mean, I, I spoke to these two young girls who were just absolutely divine, sort of 14-year-olds, ordinarily very, very shy anyway, and wouldn't, you know, dream of making eye contact, and yet they were talking about, you know, sitting beside me, you know, talking about this little boy who was up the way there, and he was, you know, trying on a pair... He was walking around in my boots, which had sort of Cuban heels on them like this, and he was only teeny tiny. <laughs> and they were talking about him, who was a brother, and... It didn't occur to me to ask them about how was he their brother, you know, mm. this little boy, the brother, until one of them volunteered that they had to constantly explain that, that this was a half-brother and who was it that told them 
that it was a half-brother. And this very complicated story for this mm. beautiful young girl who was actually really trying to focus on staying at school, being at school, loving school. Yeah. And she was very confused about why when people came into her community they needed to understand mm. who they all were and how they were related. And that was somebody else's concept of and that. And that, that's, yeah, exactly. And this that's... was a community that wasn't mired in some of the really, you know, complicated struggles that we're seeing. So, so for that... that who is kin really gets determined by the child in a community and a society, and that is all over the world. But, but legally, mm. the, the determin that determination is still very much in the mind of two parents, usually heterosexual parents, and then the responsibility follows on from, from that. Yes, but in Australia, yeah. yes. Yeah. But yeah. not everywhere. No, yeah. right. In, in lots of cultures, actually. It's where they're much further down the path of understanding and determining, not in the US, the UK and Australia, but even New Zealand has much better um, absorption of the understanding of indigeneity and, and kin because of their, um, some of their arrangements. Just, just on and a couple of things. I mean, I'm, I'm the non-birth mother, but I'm on the birth certificate. So that mm -hmm. was a change the Victorian government did about... Oh, goodness, before 2010, because that's when Elliot was born. And it was really interesting because that same year we decided to have a wedding and I was ooing and eyeing because I was like, I can't call it a wedding, we can't get married. And my ex finally just said, we're calling it a wedding. And we called it a wedding and I didn't know if my father was going to attend. Now, my by that time, my ex and I had been together for five years. She'd been in our house many times. She'd come on holidays with us. But my dad... My dad was still holding on to this hope that his daughter would marry a nice Pakistani boy. And if not, a nice white boy, but marry a boy. And my father was just really, really holding on to that hope, as, as you do when you're the father of the first child, as, as I am. And it wasn't until, like, three days before our wedding that my dad, my mum said, yes, your dad's coming. And my parents have been together for 41 years, you know, touch wood. And, and it's really interesting because... Once Elliot was born, Elliot looks so much like me. My father just went around handing out cigars to people saying, I have a grandson. <laughs> <laughs> and suddenly he went from going, oh, I'm not sure if I can recognise my daughter's relationship <laughs> to I have a child. <laughs> and interestingly enough, I was the one who was really worried about my Pakistani community. They're middle class Sydney, they live in the North Shore, my parents... And I was really worried that, oh, no, what are they going to say? And they're going to, you know, you're going to get so much flack. And my mother's attitude was like, you're my daughter. I accept you. I accept this child. He is our grandson. they got a problem with it. It's their problem. And so instantly I got this acceptance where my very unorthodox family was completely accepted. And the irony is then, when the relationship ended... I was so distressed, not just because the relationship ended, because for me, I felt, oh, my God, I am now a divorcee. I am the first person in my Pakistani culture to divorce. <laughs> oh, my God. First I'm the first queer person and now I'm the first divorced person. Too many firsts. Did you sign, if you don't mind me, did you um, fill out the census? A few years ago? We did. Not we the did. one that we just had, but no, the one no, before no. The that? No, 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 the one in 2000 and, oh, goodness, what year was it? Um, yeah, five two, years ago, yeah, so 2011. Years, 2011. Yes, yes, yep. yes. You did. Definitely. So, uh, do, do you remember what questions they asked you? On the, what the questions were on the census? I'm just very interested in this. <laughs> I'm taking a sure, poll in a minute. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure we were acknowledged, but I don't think... I'm not sure how the children were recognised. So we're under-reporting, I believe. Mm. We're under-reporting who's a step-family, who's a blended family, who's living um, de facto, who are living in different... Because what the census does is it reports or it asks questions couched in the terms of the household. Mm. So w w when it comes out, it says this, you know, that, that we have six or 7,000 families, same-sex couples with children registered on the census. But the suggestion is, with all the, the social researchers and, um, uh, you know, even obstetricians are saying there's much greater there's numbers a lot than more. that. And so does that mean that 43% could, in fact, be higher, or does that statistic come well, from...? Well, the 43% is actually 43% of, of children before the age, under the age of 13 um, are will experience a non-nuclear family environment. It's a right, okay. And that it's more than two and five mm -hmm. children who are living 
outside the parameters of mum, dad and a sibling. Mm. So understanding who's an only child, even, who is an only child as a result of bereavement, who is an only child as a result... You know, so there's a whole range of things that are giving us a picture that I'm not quite sure that that's who we, who we actually are. Mm. I certainly know that a lot of people under-report being step-parents because they don't want to be... Um, uh, because of some of the stigma in some communities that that brings for them, that they don't write it down on the census. And, and then, of course, we don't even know how many people, how many step families are there. You know, we, we know that there are a million, roughly a million sole parents and that 80% of them are women households. But, of course, you've also got the other person. So mm -hmm. if you're actually looking at the household, you're not looking at the family. And that's, I, I think, that will... If we collect that data a little differently, yeah. Do you I know think the we'll, place you know? that's collecting that data mm. in unofficially are schools? Yes, that's right. Because my son goes to a school which didn't blink an eyelid when mm. I said, two mothers, separate houses, we need separate reports, separate portfolios, separate everything. Mm. And they went, sure. Mm. There was no... So it's very much the case that the facts on the ground with families are kind of established and then sort of the institutions catch up and then the law, as rightly Follows. pointed out follows last and just to go back to the point about about sort of surrogacy and, and those sorts of things I mean it's a total nightmare and every state has different rules about surrogacy um, and there are virtually no protections for either surrogate mothers or intended parents um, and the the whole ambiguity around compensation and what's allowed to be compensated for creates huge tensions um, in surrogate families, which can create huge tensions in surrogate families, which is something that I've um, uncovered from my own research and reporting into this area. Um, and it's really something that needs to be addressed, really, as a, as a matter of urgency. I can see you nodding, nodding your head there. Just, just in terms of the law catching up, unfortunately, I had to go through the family court system over the boys, mm. and I... I made the application and on all court orders it says applicant mother and her name it says respondent mother. The judge had absolutely no issue with this being a matter between two mothers mm. and it, it was just, for him it was just like, right, two mothers and there is a custody battle on, on hand. So mm. it was, the law had, and I was very nervous because, again, going back to that whole, I didn't give birth. Yeah. But the law, at least the family court in that aspect, had caught up and said, right, both are on the birth certificate. The boys are here because of a relationship between mm. them. The relationship was legally registered. Therefore, yes, the family court applies. All right, we've got about ten minutes left. Who has another question? Yes, please. Thank you very much. It's been a fascinating discussion. Um, but it occurs to me that we've been talking for... 40 minutes, I suppose, um, as if the only thing that is a family um, is where children are. Um, and I just wondered if any of you had any comments on... Because first I started to think, yes, it's clear that families need to nourish children, all kinds of families need to nourish children, but in modern life, is there now a concept that families can also nourish the grown-ups? in the family. And then I thought, what if there are no children in the family? Um, what does that mean? Um, I don't even know really what my question is, but I think it's, <laughs> I just think it's really interesting that we have only spoken, we've, we've covered all of the sorts of families yes. that there are mm. that have children. And there are lots of families that don't That's a great point. Children. Caroline, you might like to address that maybe. Well, because you don't have any, I mean, you've got stepchildren, but you, uh, you chose yes. not to have children of your own. Uh, before that, before you had stepchildren, how did you think about that? Had you ever thought about it? I suppose that I thought that I had a family in the sense that I had a husband and I had my husband's family. Um, as well as his son. I mean, I had a, you know, I had a mother-in-law, and I should just say, I want to say something to acknowledge my um, my mother-in-law because she said something incredibly useful to me when I was really, really fretting and angsting about walking into this stepmother role for which I was absolutely not prepared. I went to have lunch with Barb, my um, my mother-in-law, one day on my own when it was obvious that things were going to be serious and permanent and I said to her I'm just not sure that I know how to how to do this and I'm not even sure that I'm going to be able to love this child because I just don't know anything about him I don't you know I never wanted to be a parent so I don't know if I can love him 
And, um, and she said, you don't have to love him. He's got a mother to do that. Mm. And all of us. Mm. You really don't have to do that. And she let me off the hook absolutely instantly. And the moment she let me off the hook, then I was free to love him gradually in my own time, which I'm very glad to say I did. But I just think that the, the freedom that she gave me in doing that was really uh, symptomatic of a very secure family of a family unit that knew that they could surround this little boy and had surrounded this little boy through four years of leukemia and divorce um, and that they didn't me need me to come riding in on a charger to fix anything. An extra numerary mother. <laughs> yes. um, did either of you have thoughts about that, that original question about you know, the idea of... Look, I, I'm, I've just been through a family court battle because for me, my children have been so important to me. I've put everything on hold because they are my family. And I also come from a world where I have sibling, parents, brother-in-law, tons of cousins, lots of uncles and aunts, grandparents who adore me. So I've grown up with lots and lots of people, like not Roman Catholic, but definitely that big clan feeling. And so for me, having children was always going to happen because it was this thing about wanting to continue my family. And one thing I keep on thinking about is there was a point where I thought Elliot would be it and we should stop, and we were arguing a lot. So I thought, not a good idea to bring another child into an unhappy home. And she wore me down with the, um, but who will Elliot play with? Mm. And I went, OK, we're going to have another one. Mm. And it's really interesting now because now that I am divorced and the boys move between the two houses, they have each other. And I am so grateful for that because even if their mums can't get along, they have each other mm. and they do play together and they do move together and they're in a really good space because of that. It's interesting that you say that though, you know, because again, one of the statistics that really threw me, uh, you know, I did a little bit of research for the book just to sort of find out what the kind of context was with only children. And you would think that most only children would be desperate to create that great, big, rowdy, messy kind of cloud streety kind of uh, scenario. But the statistics show that most only children marry other only children and have only children. Um, uh, that really baffled me. It, it seemed completely, completely counterintuitive. So I'm just throwing that out there as a counter to what you just said. Go for it. <laughs> it's a growing group, the um, group of uh, families without children. It's another increasing, um, you know, I suppose target market for advertisers too. But um, it certainly is interesting in our street and in my childhood, um, which is what I've based a lot of my own anecdotes in, in my book about. There are a couple of couples in our street who are much older couples who have no children, one has a result of their child dying and another who decided not to have children and they're in their 60s now and 70s and they are very much a part of a community where they're involved in the raising of, you know, their kind of grandparent figures and things. So they're very actually central to the people around them even though they've made these choices. I think we're still a bit, um, a bit curious about mm. those people who decide that they don't want to have children. And I, I think it's really interesting because Well, it it's is... a little bit like the trigger word of spoilt with only children. When we see people who haven't had children, we say, oh, yours, they must be selfish. Mm. Uh, those words are so loaded, mm. you know, and I do think that they are a kind of automatic reflex sort of mm. default setting that you use sometimes without thinking. And there are so many reasons thinking. why people yeah. decide yeah. not to have children. Absolutely. And, yeah, Absolutely. again, it's what, what are we actually... What are we actually looking at? What, do, what is the map of, of Australian families and what does it really look like? So thank you very much for raising that, that mm. point. One more question down the back is all we've got time for. I actually just wanted to make a comment in response um, to the earlier question um, regarding artificial insemination and where that fits into the modern family sphere. So I had a child using a donor embryo and um, there is a wonderful website run by a UK organisation 
And the reason I think it's wonderful is that it publishes a lot of stories told from the point of view of the children. Mm -hmm. So what it's like for them when they find out that their um, donor conception, um, how they've processed that, you know, what it's like being told at different ages. Because I think, um, for me, once I got through that sort of storm of IVF and process all that sort of stuff, my main concern going forward is how my child will process that. And she will most likely be a single child, because I'm not going to do that again. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's called the DCM Network, and I haven't found anything like that in Australia. So mm -hmm. that's a good resource to look to. And how old is your child, may I ask? She's two and a half. OK. So have you had the conversation with her yet? Um, I have a storybook that talks about, you know, different families and how Mama went to a clinic and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, Daddy, so she's a, I'm a single parent, so Daddy comes up a lot in childcare. Mm -hmm. So she knows there is such a thing as a Daddy, but um, we haven't, because they're not really aware of gender and things yet, I don't think, so I've kind of linked that to just a man is a Daddy and we haven't gone too much further than that. Um, so, yeah, I've tried to mention the words and normalise them and at some point when she asks me, I'll try and be open about it. Um, but, yeah, I'm just feeling my way, really. I don't... We, <laughs> we're all feeling our way. We had just... a, um, an interesting experience that I wanted to just share with you that when, when our uh, little one was in prep, she came home, or maybe it was last year, she came home and she said... Um, so somebody said to me that uh, you're my half, I'm your half sister to one of the children. And, you know, this look of shock and horror on the other kids' faces, they're going, no, you know. And then, uh, so, you know, what they come home from kindy or school or prep mm -hmm. with, you know, you can anticipate. But some of the teachers have been so fabulous. And I've found, um, you know, they often tell you, they just make stuff up. On the on the go about it with the with the kids in their classroom, you know they they really wing it because they have to now that they've got a much more diverse mm. classroom. But um, she also says somebody said to her, "So what's it like being in a step family?" She said, "What's that?" Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so you know really it's the children mm. uh, very much who will inform us as to how we should respond, you know, rather than the other way around. Mm. And Lena, you just I, to I was just going to say just two things. Elliot's now seven, but. Since he was very little, we did we did talk to him about a donor, and it became such common language for him that he knew I don't have a dad, and we had this song about you have two mums, double the hugs, blah blah blah, but no dad. And when we went to Sydney, and he must have been about three, and my dad said we're going out to eat a donor kebab, and he just <laughs> freaked out. <laughs> what? 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 But that's a gift. That's a gift. I'm here because of a donor kebab. <laughs> That's something for us all to bear in mind, the, the final lesson. That's a lovely place to leave it. Um, look, thank, thank you all so much for your uh, questions this evening. Um, clearly, this is just such a fascinating topic. We could be here for, for hours, and um, we're all just feeling our way, though, ultimately, really, is, is the bottom line, isn't it? So will you join me in thanking our fantastic panellists, Alina Mohamed Ali, Chloe Shorten, and Caroline Baum. Visit wheelercentre.com for the best in books, writing and ideas from Melbourne, Australia and the world.